So thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully uh, Saturday won't be too long today, but thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Robin Hall. I work at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. I, work, I have to disclose, I do work on a program, uh, a project called Reactome. I'll be talking a lot about that today, uh, but I will be talking about some other resources. Now, I have a background in microbiology, uh, genetics, genomics, proteomics, and bioinformatics. So I've done the whole thing. I know Francis for a long time. In fact, I've known Michelle for a very long time. And if you think a week is hard for like doing a bioinformatics course, when I first started, we did two week courses. I actually was an alumni at that time. I'm actually an alumni of the CBW. Um, so it's, it's funny for me to be here actually and talking to you today about pathways and networks. So let's get started. I'm going to skip through the slides here. Got some nice illustrations of things you're going to see later today. And Yuri gave this slide the other day, and I want to start off with this slide first, just so we can understand a few things. Yuri went through goal one, basically enrichment analysis of gene lists or gene sets. Um, basically, we're going to today we're going to talk about goals two and three, and I want to say for, that goals one and two and three are very much complementary approaches. Um, I want to say that they're run in parallel. So I want to make sure that you understand that the outputs here from this, this analysis don't just automatically feed into two. You can actually, in fact, use the same gene lists that you've, you've been working with through the other day in, in goal one, can easily be inputted into goal two, and potentially could feed into goal three. Um, goal three with pathway-based modeling is going to require a little bit of qualitative and quantitative data. And that may not necessarily be available for all people. But really, goals one and two are very complementary approaches. You can run them in parallel and sometimes get the same results. And sometimes, depending on the algorithms and approaches, you can get dissimilar results. Okay. Um, just So with goal two, we're going to talk about de novo subnetwork construction and clustering. And this is where I'm going to introduce the Reactome Functional Interaction Tool later today. This is a tool that works within Cytoscape, which allows you to analyze your gene lists, gene expression data, and somatic mutation information as well. Um, and it allows you essentially to answer questions like, are new pathways altered in, in cancer? And are there clinically relevant tumor samples? Um, the reason I talk a lot about cancer, and forgive the, the non-cancer researchers here, is that they have the best data sets right now out there in terms of like sample numbers, uh, information about clinical data, uh, very rich annotations of gene information like experimental gene expression data, copy number, varia copy number variation data, somatic mutation information. So it is, it is the be kind of like the better data sets to represent. Um, and then finally, pathway-based model, pathway, uh, modeling. It's a much younger approach than goals one and two. Um, it's a little bit more experimental. Um, but I think there's some value there because it helps to evaluate how pathways and networks, their states themselves, are disrupted in disease. Um, and it allows you to analyze more than one, one data set or one data type at a time. Um, and you can answer questions as to how are pathway activities altered in a particular patient and really asking questions like are there targetable pathways in these patients. Um, so I think that's where I want to start. So let's take a step back and talk a little bit more about pathway network analysis. So one of the challenges that lies with analyzing huge amounts of data is really extracting meaningful information and using that to answer some fundamental biological questions. So pathway and network analysis tries to incorporate prior biological knowledge um, to analyze genes, proteins, in groups uh, in a biological context. So basically, the first goal really is to dramatically reduce that data size. You could have potentially, when I first started in research, I was looking at one gene, one protein, one pathway. Now you're looking at, you can look at, in fact, in the early days of microarray analysis, you could be looking at hundreds of genes. Now you can look at thousands of genes, you can look at thousands of genes across multiple samples, rather than just having you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, you could have billions of data points. How do you reduce that down in complexity and, and take a biological, an answer of the biological question? So it also, it's also a good approach to uh, increase the statistical power by reducing multiple hypotheses. 
Um, I, I put in this line about finding the meaning in the long tail of rare cancer mutations, and that's because somatic mutation uh, data, there's, there's clearly some driver mutations that are most interesting and well studied, but there's these you know, lists of hundreds, thousands of genes that are just there, and it's not clear to you what, what those genes are actually contributing to a particular phenotype and a disease. And then you can tell a whole host of other biological stories with pathways and networks. Um, we've talked about uh, identifying hidden patterns within gene lists. Pathways are a great way to view what you're doing in the lab. Uh, essentially, uh, they helped to create these kind of mechanistic models to explain your experimental observations. Uh, Quaid, who isn't here yet, will talk a little bit more about how func you can actually predict the function of unannotated genes later with gene mania. So I won't necessarily talk about that just now. Um, reaction graphs, pathway graphs, network graphs are all very useful resources in starting to build up a framework for quantitative modeling and systems biology. I'll touch a little bit on that as I go through my talk. And then um, and we'll, we'll, de we'll try to demonstrate this a little bit using the React on Functional Interaction Network as well, is how you can use this in developing molecular signatures for identifying prognostic signatures. Uh, so pathway and network analysis to me is an analytical technique that makes use of biological pathway and molecular interaction or molecular network information to gain insights into a biological system. I would say it is, having been in the game for at least 15 years, it is still rapidly evolving. Um, and there are many approaches. I can barely scratch the surface today in the next hour or so with some of those techniques. What I've tried to do is focus on those that are actually probably the most relevant to you and the ones that uh, have actually the largest uh, community support and are very valuable to your research. So to explain my kind of, I, think, I don't know if Yuri, did, if Yuri showed this slide the other day, but I wanted to give you a different, he did, I wanted to give you a, my take on what difference, what a pathway is and what a network is. So to me, a biological pathway is a series of events amongst a bunch of molecules within a cell. And that leads to a certain product or a change in a cell state, something like that. And you've got metabolic pathways, which compose a lot of chemical reactions. You've got signal transduction, which is traditionally moving a signal from outside of the cell to exterior. But I like to think that it occurs the other way as well. You also have gene regulation pathways. You'll hear a lot more, I think, from that from Michael Hoffman tomorrow. Um, basically, you're turning genes on and off. But in the case of networks, um, most pathways don't have a start point A and an end point Z. Um, there's no real boundaries. And sometimes pathways intersect with one another. You get this idea of crosstalk. And it's when you start having to think about multiple pathways, really you're starting to look at their interactions and then you start thinking about networks. And you could argue in some ways that you know, the, the view that we have in pathways is somewhat abstract. It's, a, it's, it's something that was created, well, way back uh, in the, you know, the, the mid, let's say the mid 20th century. I mean, it, it's pathways have been around for many, many years, but it's, it's something that researchers have created. Networks are more, abstract, uh, are less abstract, but more, uh, they lose a lot of that information, that rich information that you find in pathways, like uh, particular uh, protein states, um, and other uh, regulators and activators that kind of modulate some of these reactions. Um, but the bottom line is both approaches are very complementary and they help us to learn a lot about human disease. Uh, and so um, identifying what genes and proteins and other molecules are involved in a biological pathway can actually help us uh, provide clues to about what goes wrong in a disease state. So there are many different pathway databases out there. If you go to a, a, there's a resource link, it's in the notes called Pathway Guide, you'll find easily 300 different pathway databases. They differ based on the type of information that they've curated, or have they automatically derived that from text mining, or if they automatically derive that information from a lot of high throughput data experiments. Um, they also differ on species. They offer, when I say species, I refer to the types of organism that they reflect. So some pathways focus on human pathways, others on worm, and so forth. Um, 
Also, the other thing about pathway databases is that they should provide a curated, from my point of view, a, a biochemical view of pathways and processes where you're seeing cause and effect captured within a human um, interpret and in, in a human interpretable visualization. So there has to be a diagram there that you can you can see one once you've seen one pathway diagram, you know, if someone did show you another pathway diagram, you can easily understand that. There are some few, few caveats to pathway databases, and that is the coverage of the genome. Um, because a lot of pathway databases are curated and that people are looking through the literature to identify molecules and, and building up these pathways, it takes time. And so um, and also some of the experiments that people perform are not necessarily the best experiments. I should carefully choose my words here. Uh, but, um, and so that information doesn't necessarily get reflected in, in a particular pathway. Um, the other thing is that some databases disagree on the boundaries of where the pathway ends. I think there's a core element to most pathways, but when you start looking at activators and inhibitors and, and different kind of crosstalk between pathways, that's where the boundaries kind of get a bit vague. That's where networks become more valuable, I think. But uh, that's something to kind of appreciate. So um, I'm going to talk. We're going to talk. We're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Reactome. Uh, but I also want to mention CAG, and there's resources like Panther as well, and uh, the National Cancer Institute uh, Pathway Interaction Database, or NCIPID. These are all kind of reaction network databases. In fact, you could scrub the, the database off and call it a knowledge base. A knowledge base to me is a resource which has a lot of information about the molecules, the pathways, they've got graphical visualizations, they've got tools for analysis, and they've got options for you to be able to kind of download the data and actually use that information in third-party tools. Um, Reacto, as I said, I work for Reacto, so I have a little bias here, but uh, I'm very familiar with CAG and other pathway databases. Um, these are reaction network databases because they explicitly describe biological processes as a series of biochemical reactions. Um, and it can allow us, the flexibility of this data model allows you to represent many different events and states found in biology. So you can describe metabolic pathways, signaling pathways, and uh, gene regulatory pathways using this approach. And essentially, it, it really looks like a classical chemical reaction. You have a series of inputs. It could be one or more. Uh, feeding into the reaction, and then you have a series of outputs. Again, it could be one or more outputs. And then the outputs ultimately become the subsequent inputs for a following event, and you start just locking these pieces together just like a jigsaw puzzle. And what's important about these databases is that they should be explicitly describing the molecules in, uh, in the reaction. So for the case of Reacto and CAG, they could be using resources like Uniprot to describe proteins, small molecules, KEBI. Uh, they'll include non-coding RNAs that may have disease variants and other therapeutics as well. Um, in terms of the describing elements of the reaction, you can look, I think Yuri introduced you to gene ontology the other day, so you can use Go biological process to describe regulations or molecular function to describe the catalytic activity. Uh, and these reactions can occur in particular cellular compartments, so we can use the cell component term there as well. The other thing to point out is that wherever possible, you should be linking these reactions and pathways back to the primary literature. So if you ever want to question something, you should be able to go back to a PubMed citation. Now, the caveat there is that some of the metabolic pathways you can only find in textbooks, but they're kind of like Stryer and, uh, what was the other one? You, you'll find essentially the kind of central dogma of molecular biology and metabolism in these textbooks, and they can be considered reliable sources of information. So this is my view of pathway databases. Um, CAG um, is a collection of, it's not just about pathways, it's a collection of biological information. Um, it's clear to point out that this is compiled from published material, so there's a team of, team of scientists who basically read the, the papers, and they extract the irrelevant information, and they put that into the database. So we call this a curated database. So they'll have information about genes, proteins, the pathways, the interactions, and the reactions. And they associate with specific organisms. And there is many hundreds of organisms supported by CAG. Um, and they provide this kind of relationship or a map, a diagram, uh, with how these, or these components are organized in a particular cellular structure or a pathway. 
This here is a, a typical view of a CAG pathway. Uh, typically fits on one slide. Uh, the green elements in the diagram represent the proteins. Uh, you can see some genes here in white. You can have these kind of larger oval shapes. Uh, these are encapsulated pathways. So this is showing the crosstalk between uh, this particular pathway, the cell cycle pathway, and the MAP carry signaling. Also, uh, ubiquitin mediated proteolysis and apoptosis. The lines themselves represent uh, the different types of reactions. Uh, the arrows typically, the, with the typically represent uh, activation. The vertical line, the, sorry, the perpendicular line represents inhibition. Uh, and sometimes just uh, single lines represent just direct interactions, but no additional information. Um, you, of course, these are useful diagrams because you can start overlaying experimental data on top of this. Um, KEG does provide those tools for you to do this type of analysis, um, but, but um, you can only browse the information in the pathway and you have to use third-party tools to kind of overlay your data onto the diagrams. Reactome, on the other hand, oh yes, the other thing to point out with KEG um, is that its model is licensed such that you can browse the website and you can use those resources freely. But when you start trying to download data, um, you have to get a license, whether you're an academic or an industrial user. And, you know, there are other tools like out there called Ingenuity, I haven't necessarily summarized them, that prefer you have to purchase a license. Now, my difficulty with some of those tools is that when it's licensed information and I don't have access to that information, how do I reproduce your experiments? There's not a lot of transparency in those, some of those tools as well. And so resources like Reactum try to make everything open source and open access so that everything that we do is 100% is transparent. And you, know, you can use the data freely for whatever you would like to do. You can use our tools as freely as you want to. You know. What does the stand for? Uh, oh gosh, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, or Genomes and Genes. It could be one of that way. Um, so, uh, so Reactome uh, is also a curated resource. We focus primarily on the curation of human pathways, uh, and as I said, it can help theories of metabolism, signaling, and other biological processes. Uh, pathways are traceable back to the primary literature, and we extensively cross-reference to other databases out there so that we can enrich our own annotations with gene, protein, small molecule information. And then we provide tools for data analysis and visualization. So here in this diagram, uh, in the screenshot, I'm showing you the, the Reactome Pathway Browser. It's the main visualization tool to browse the biological pathways and to analyze experimental data, uh, whether that's a gene list, a protein list, or a small molecule list. Um, on the left here, we have a pathway hierarchy, which lists all the pathways known to Reactome. Um, they have a particular iconography for pathways. And you can, as you explore these different levels of the hierarchy, you can see different levels of the sub-pathways and their relationships to the reactions as well. And as you interact with this display, uh, you'll see uh, pathways, diagrams, visual uh, diagrams appearing here in this panel on the right. And then at the bottom here, you have this details panel, which provides you with more textual and graphical information about molecules, uh, protein structures, experimental data, um, whether that's data that you're actually uploading in or data that's already been provided by things like Gene Expression Atlas. Um, so in this particular view, we're actually I've uh, just overlaid gene expression data onto this pathway diagram. So the different colored entities reflect uh, different gene expressions of genes that are upregulated. And then uh, Reactum has this idea of complexes uh, so one icon represents many molecules, and so these kind of uh, horizontal lines that you see reflect uh, the expression values for different components of the complex. So these are great resources, both KEG and Reactum, to actually explore pathways and to analyze data. Now, if you would like to do some of this yourself and you need a good source of pathway data that isn't necessarily available in Reactum or KEG, uh, one good source is called Pathway Commons. I think Yuri might have introduced you to this yesterday. Um, so it's a very useful resource for network biology, uh, and it acts as, essentially as a convenient um, uh, access to biological pathway and network information. 
that's collected from a variety of different public um, pathway databases. So you can search, uh, you, you could visualize, and you could download pathway and network information from this resource. So um, now that I've talked about pathways, I want to focus a little bit more on in interactions. I believe Yuri introduced you a little bit to the networks yesterday uh, inside Escape. And I just want to use this slide to remind you of just a few, of just a few things. Um, the nodes and the edges within interaction networks can be almost anything you want it to be. Um, so typically, nodes can be genes, proteins, metabolites, groups of complexes and things like that. So any sort of object. Edges can either be physical, functional interactions. They could be activators, regulators, reactions. Any sort of relationship. Um, and in fact, in the next slide, I'm going to show you there's different types, and as such, there's many different types of interaction networks out there. Um, most cellular networks are available for what I call the supermodal organisms. So things like Drosophila yeast, C. elegans, and Arabidopsis. There is also uh, human interaction maps available as well. Um, although I would say the model organisms are far more well studied. Um, and as such, when you take into different considerations about genes, proteins, small molecules, you get these different types of networks. So we have a uh, transcriptional regulatory network where the nodes within that network could represent transcription factors and the putative DNA regulatory elements. And the edges are just demonstrating the relationship between those two entities. Um, Michael Hoffman tomorrow will tell you more about this type of network. Virus host networks. So the nodes represent viral and viral and human proteins, and the edges are representing the relationship between those two those two nodes. Metabolic networks. So this is where things change a little bit in terms of so the nodes represent the enzymes, and the edges themselves. This time, rather than demonstrating a relate, well, they are demonstrating a relationship, but they're actually the edges are actually the substrates and products of those enzymes, okay, which is a little different view. And then you have this thing called disease networks. And the disease nodes, the nodes are the diseases, the disease terms, and the actual edges connecting those diseases are, in fact, the gene mutations you would expect. So there's, there's different attributes you can apply to these networks. By far the biggest group and most widely applicable to data analysis is the protein-protein interaction network. Sometimes it's referred to as a gene-gene interaction network, but essentially it's the same thing. It's essentially one and the same. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about this today. Now, um, information about the relative importance of the nodes and edges within a network uh, can be obtained by applying a variety of different graph measures or algorithms. And they've been widely developed through uh, other areas like sociology and more recently applied to network biology. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time going through these different algorithms, but it's important for you to understand, as you kind of like look at these networks, how some of these structures come into existence. So the most, um, most popular terms being used are degree, closeness, and betweenness. So degree, you see the number of edges that a node has. So if you look at the green node, which is in the middle, there, you'll see that that represents the node with the highest degree of connectivity within that graph. Okay, And then closeness is the measure of how close a node is to other nodes in the network. So if we actually look at the two red nodes here, um, you see that these are the, the nodes with the highest closeness. And then between this is basically quantifying the shortest number, the number of short, all the shortest paths that pass through a particular node. So if we look at the purple node here, this is the node with the highest betweenness. Um, probably one of the most robust um, measures for network topology is the average shortest path, um, which is divide, defined as the average of all the shortest paths amongst all the nodes within the network. So just as an example, if you were to ask the question, um, what's the shortest path between you and Mark Zuckerberg? Okay, that basically is the number of people that you need to communicate with in order for you to actually contact the owner of Facebook. That's the shortest path. That's the simplest real world example of it. Um, but they have huge applicability uh, in network biology. 
And as I'm talking more about Cytoscape later today and demonstrating in the lab, you'll learn more about these different algorithms. Um, and there are a number of other applications that you can, you can use in Cytoscape to help you do a lot of these kind of graph measures um, and calculate a lot of basic network properties. Uh, Centispeed is one of them. Um, and basically, you can just install these apps into Cytoscape, you can create your network, and then you can actually apply these different algorithms to start understanding the network structures. Now, um, now I want to talk a little bit about the network databases that are out there. Uh, again, the same pathway guide also lists the network databases, and there's plenty of them out there as well, there's several hundred of them. Uh, Sometimes people think network databases are, in fact, pathway databases as well. I think there's differences. I believe that pathway databases have a much level, a higher level of biological knowledge available um, because some network databases, they differ very much on how that information is generated. Um, so people can use uh, text mining to uh, identify interactions. They could just basically suck in all of that high throughput data that's out there in these publications to create these networks. Or they could physically go into the individual papers where people have done small-scale biology, identify those interactions in the paper, and put that into the database. And that latter step is called curation, and by far I think is the best source of information for interaction data. Um, it does have more extensive coverage to biological systems. I would say a typical pathway database will probably have about 30% coverage of the, the genome. Um, interaction databases, it can vary between 60 to 75%. Um, the information pertaining to the relationships and the underlying evidence describing the interactions is a little bit more tentative, I think, for some interactions, particularly those that are based on high throughput data analysis. There's a lot of noise in those data sets, but I would say that where you have manual curation and multiple papers citing the same type of interaction between two molecules, then there's a high degree of confidence that that uh, interaction will occur, I would say, in, in cells. Not all, but not all cells, because we haven't tested the interactions that occur within a cell in all the different types of cells within tissues and organs that we have in our body. Um, popular sources for curated network data is BioGrid, Intact, and Mint. I would say these are the three main ones. Um, you could have other ones. Um, these resources are not, they differ slightly on their content, the, the approaches of, um, uh, of curation, also the scope and, or coverage of the different species, the model organisms that people have studied and the interactions have been uh, derived from. Um, but I would say that in the next slide, Intact is probably one of the better resources. Um, so just as an example, in the screenshot, we're searching for P53, and you get this kind of table format, typically of molecule A being the bait protein, uh, molecule B being the interactor. Uh, it's good to see that they're using uh, identifiers to describe these different molecules so that you can link those back to a protein database. Um, they also have information about how that interaction was detected, the experimental approach. And then they have a variety of other different annotations specific for that interaction. And then Intact is demonstrating, well, Intact has curated some of that interactions. Some of that other interaction information is coming from Uniprot, Mint, and then, so that's in some ways demonstrating that, you know, Intact is aggregating other interaction data from other resources as well. So it's a rather useful resource you, of course, can download the data from these different databases and start using the tools to, to visualize these networks. Now, before I introduce you to some of the different approaches for data analysis, I want to just take a moment to introduce you to some of the tools for visualization. Uh, so Cytoscape, you heard about yesterday, it's by far the most popular tool. Um, and I would say uh, the, it's, it has the most support from the community in terms of the applications and publications to, and also the user guides and how to uh, use Cytoscape. So I think it's very valuable. Um, there are other tools like Navigator. Uh, it's a powerful graphing application for 2D and 3D uh, visualizations of biological networks. 
It has a rather rich suite of markup tools, so you can annotate the nodes and edges within the network. It's fast, and I would say it's a bit more scalable than Cytoscape, so it actually can support very large networks. Um, uh, although I would say that very large networks are probably uninformative to you. They look like fur balls or a ball of string, and you'll never really understand what's going on there, and which is why you need to use the, you know, the tools to kind of filter that, that larger network down to a kind of smaller sub-network where you can then generate your hypothesis. Uh, there's another tool called Osprey. Um, it's a tool for visualization and manipula manipulation of complex interaction networks. Um, it has a kind of data-rich uh, interaction view. Um, you can color code nodes according to the functional annotations and experimental data. Um, there are other tools out there, and as I said, there's, there's probably easily a dozen widely used tools for network exploring networks in biology. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about gene mania, I believe, this afternoon from Quaid. So um, that's a, another good resource for visualizing networks. Now, in order to use some of these tools, um, <clears throat> you need to be able to exchange data from a database to that tool. And so there's a variety of different data exchange languages. Let's call them languages to make this simple. Essentially, all they are is a data file. They can either be in a simple tab delimited format, or it could be an XML document. Don't worry too much about the technology that uh, generates, the, generates the data file or how the content's represented in the file. Just let's understand that it's an easy way to exchange information from a database to one of these tools. Some of the tools automatically do it, so you never see that information. You never see that information, but just in the off chance, you get to one of these resources or Pathway Commons, and you're basically using a tool like Cytoscape, and you want to know how to create your network. Well, you can download data. And I'm using React as the example, so you can download um, data, molecular interaction data, using this PSI MyTab format, and Sidekick is the effort that basically is to standardize. Um, access to molecular interaction data within these databases. And PSI MyTab is this kind of tab delimited format for data exchange. So you just download this file and you can upload it into Cytoscape. Um, systems biology markup language. Uh, this is more for people that are interested in building uh, systems biology or biological models of pathways and networks. Uh, SBGN, this is a standard uh, representation of the graph itself. Uh, and so um, every node has a particular shape, and the, the edge or the relationship between the two nodes has a particular style as well. And so that information is retained in the, the systems biology graphical notation. Um, and then there's Biopax, which I'm not actually sure what it means. I've always only ever known it as Biopax. It probably means biological pathways and, some, and something. Um, it's basically a standard language, which basically is there to... Uh, enable integration exchange of biological pathway data. It sounds like these languages all kind of do the same thing. Yes, they do, but they do it in slightly different ways, and they're compatible with different tools. So in the next slide, we're just taking a, I'm taking an example of, there's a uh, pathway in reaction called the amyloid pathway. It's involved in um, neurodegenerative disease. And basically, you can download the SBML file from this amyloid pathway and directly upload it into a tool called Cell Designer. And that's a graph modeling tool, so you can start building your, your, um, your model, your biological model. Uh, you can upload the Biopax file into Cytoscape, um, or you can directly connect from Cytoscape to Reactome and just do that automatically. And finally, um, if the SPGN file, you can just upload that information into a tool called Vaunted, and you can basically start creating your own graphical uh, representation of reactome pathways. So for much of the time, when you're doing this kind of approach um, of analysis, you're basically creating a network using one of these tools. And then you're going to overlay attribute data. That's your experimental data onto particular nodes or edges, depending on the type of information that you have. Um, but 
Another approach I want to talk, start talking about now is where you take your list of genes, and they could be, you know, they could be just a simple gene list. It could be a list of genes that you know have somatic mutations. It could be gene expression data, and you project that gene list into uh, a much larger pre-constructed network. So before, in the previous slide, you know, we're, we've got relatively small networks, and that's when you overlay your data onto that network. It's one single view. Now we're moving into an area where you've got a larger network, and you want to filter down uh, that network to create something um, more useful. So the idea is to identify what they call topologically unlikely configurations. That's basically a subset of genes that seem to interact very closely with one another um, in the network more than you'd expect by chance alone. And then you can extract these clusters using different algorithms. And then based on the assumption that the genes within the, net, the cluster are involved in similar biological processes, you can use the enrichment tools that you learned about yesterday to annotate those modules. And in fact, the Reactome Functional Interaction Network application I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show you later, can help you to do a lot of this work for you. So let's just take a moment to talk about network clustering. So clustering is defined as a process of grouping objects into a set. So that's a cluster. Um, I sometimes use that. I also sometimes call it modules. So I sometimes refer to a network cluster as a network module. And there is also, uh, you can also think of it as a community. So it could be network communities as well. And the thing that reflect that these nodes within this cluster, they have something in similarity, uh, something in common. Um, there are a variety of different network clustering algorithms that perform this task. I'm going to try my best to explain some of these algorithms without using equations, because they are scary equations to look at. Um, but basically, you're looking for sets of nodes or proteins uh, that are joined together in tightly knit groups. And essentially, cluster detection for large networks is very useful in identifying highly connected proteins that share similar functionality. Um, and so uh, this is where I kind of try and do my best to explain some of these clustering algorithms. Uh, Gervin Newman is the first one. So basically you start off with your, your network and you start chiseling away at the edges with the highs between this, you know, that and then you continue to chisel away in that network. You drill it down until you almost break the network up into individual nodes. You kind of get to a point where you stop and you see these tightly knit communities of, of proteins. And between those kind of tight knit communities is a sparse number of connections. That's ideally what Newman algorithm is trying to do. Um, and we actually in the, the Reactive Functional Interaction Network We'll show you how to do that. And I have a slide in the next which shows you the result of that clustering. The Markov clustering algorithm. Now, um, this is one that's a little bit more difficult to explain. So my limited understanding is that it basically tries to simulate a flow within a graph and promotes flow in highly, and basically you're looking for promotion of flow within highly connected regions uh, in the network. And it demotes the kind of other sparser, con the sparser connections. So if you can imagine, for example, you're in a network and you're taking a random walk, and basically you're going to, you suddenly come along and you're visiting a dense cluster, an area with a lot of connections. You're more likely to walk around those connections than you are to go off in another area uh, where there's like a sparser connections. And so that's essentially what the cluster, it, the, the, the clustering Markov algorithm is trying to do. It it works very well with gene expression data. So when you want to actually try to weight a network based on gene expression data, you can actually use this Markov clustering algorithm and it actually works really well. Hotnet, again, we're getting into another area of... Sorry? Yes, very similar. Very similar. Uh, so they were asking whether whether a hidden Markov clustering is the same type of approach, and it is. It's, it's just the same name. Um, so Hotnet, um, so this is a kind of like a really kind of crazy uh, way of looking at it. So imagine you convert your gene network into a metal lattice. 
you know, like a grill, not a, like a grill, like a, you've got these weaves. Um, so I was going to say draw it like a sort of rectangle, but it's not straightforward to think of it as a rectangle. But maybe that's a way to think about it. And you basically, each of the connection points in your lattice is a node. And the lines are basically the relationships. You just lay it out. And then um, you use the physics of heat diffusion to basically study, to model the effects of these gene alterations. So uh, the thing to point out with HotNet, it works really well with somatic mutation data and uh, takes into consideration the frequency of mutations and those interactions between the different nodes within the network. Anyway, um, back to the, this, this, this wire, the, this wire mesh. So as you heat up a piece of that metal lattice, like you're heating up a gene, you know, it's going to get hot. Now, if you have a, one of those temperature gauges, you're going to see like cold areas on that metal lattice, and you're going to see like a really hot spot where you're heating up that metal lattice. Let's imagine you're heating up with a Bunsen burner or something like that. Um, now, if you start heating up more of those different genes in that lattice, you, and you look at your heat gun and you can see like certain elements of that lattice are going to heat up more than others. That's essentially what you're trying to do. You're going to get these local hot networks. Um, sorry, local you know, hot networks, you know, um, or locations. So that's basically a similar kind of approach um, to to the Gervin and Newman, but it's just a different algorithm, really. And then hypermodules um, tries to identify some... So it, it's, it's very applicable to cancer, uh, studying cancer mutations, because um, it tries to identify sub-networks within those cancer mutations. Um, and it uses kind of clinical characteristics to correlate that information. So things like patient survival or tumor sample, um, excuse me, it's really, sorry, the tool is actually very useful in trying to identify uh, tumor subtypes by extracting networks where the mutations um, are significantly enriched in a particular subtype. Uh, it's not a tool that I've frequently used, but I've heard or I've looked at some papers and it's actually um, remarkably well, well published. So um, that's all I can say about hypermodules. And then the reactome functional interaction cytoscape application basically tries to use some of these different algorithms. And in the lab, we'll actually do this and we'll, you'll see how these tool, the the tool helps you to create these kind of clusters and to add it then to annotate those clusters. So typically when you actually, um, yes? Yes. Yes. How, so the question is how specific these algorithms are for biological use cases. And yeah. the answer is very. Okay. They're, ver they're very widely used. Um, I would say that most of the, the algorithms for studying networks has been developed because of sociology experiments, people understanding the connections between you and this audience. Facebook uses, like, uses the same algorithms to understand the relationships between people in that in the, in, the, in the Facebook community. Um, and wherever networks are used, whether it's telecommunications industry, you name it, they're using these similar types of approaches to understand the information that they're generating. So um, I would say that really of the three at the top here are the, probably the most applicable ones. That's why I'm listing them all. There are other things, like even things like studying the... the bees within a hive, bee, uh, sorry, bee, uh, bees, uh, little bees, uh, flying around. Um, you can actually understand the sociology and the interactions between different bees within a community using algorithms. Um, and in fact, some of those al same algorithms are actually used in biology, although I wouldn't necessarily use them. <laughs> and the second question, yeah. yeah. So, as a, suppose you're, as a user, how important is it to, like, how deeply do you need to understand these so I tried my best to explain them to you today. If I were to show you the equations, I would lose all of you. I would honestly believe if you want to get into them, 
you can look at the papers to understand how the network algorithms have been deployed. But truly, I think you, you just, in a sense, accept them for what they are. They've been well tested, well published. Um, if there's any caveats to like particular algorithm with a particular data, you know, it's worthy to look at the publications or the user documentation for these different approaches to rule some of those out. Now, where am I? Okay, so um, the typical output of this clustering uh, is shown here. Um, so basically, we've got a, a hypothetical subnetwork which is composed uh, dec or is decomposed into six clusters. Okay, so you can see that most of the clusters have ten or more genes, and you can see that there is, you know. Uh, a higher degree of connectivity within the genes within the clusters and some sparser connections across between two clusters. Um, one cluster, just to point out here, cluster six only has two interactions. Okay, now I might ignore that from my further investigations and the reason for that is when you start in uh, uh, annotating these modules, two genes could well have many, many biological functions and the question is which biological function are you looking for? When you have larger gene, when you have larger groups of genes, you know you still could potentially get a lot of biological processes. But the chances are you can actually narrow that list down to a, like a handful of pathways. And the other thing to point out is that the, cl the clusters are mutually exclusive, meaning that nodes are not shared between uh, the different clusters. So the gene exists with, with a particular gene or a protein will exist in only one cluster. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the Reactome Functional Interaction Network uh, and the visualization app that's available in Cytoscape. So we'll learn about a little bit more. We're actually in the, in, the, in the lab afterwards. We're going to learn about how to use this tool to upload a gene list uh, and somatic mutation data to actually um, create a network and create these wonderful little, well, not quite at this publications level at the end, but you will get something where you can have you can organize the network into discrete cl clusters, and you can know what the, the potential biological roles of these genes in these clusters are. So, yes. Um, so, in, so again, it's just reiterating some of the points made earlier, uh, and in particular with cancer, um, no single mutation, no, no single mutated gene is necessarily insufficient to cause cancer. Typically what you have is uh, a handful of mutations, uh, common mutations like p53, p10, EGFR, and then you have this like long tail of hundreds, maybe even thousands of other mutations which could be putative drivers within that list, but they're in very rare subtypes, or they're just passenger mutations. And the question really is, you know, what are the role of these genes in this disease, in this phenotype? So by analyzing these mutated genes in a, in a network context, it reveals the relationship between these genes. You potentially elucidate the mechanism of action of the drivers and possibly the passenger mutations. It very much facilitates hypothesis generation of the roles of these genes in a particular phenotype. And as I said at the start, it dramatically reduces that gene list from whether hundreds or thousands of genes down to a handful of mutated pathways or uh, 
essentially a dozen or so pathways. Uh, you, you know, you can get your hypothesis, you can generate your hypothesis, and then you can take that back into the laboratory to kind of verify some of that uh, results. This is a dis this is discovery. This is this tool is a discovery tool. Uh, you can uh, use the tool to kind of uh, prove some of the hypotheses that you've generated in the lab. It can work that way. You know, you have the experiment, you've, do, you've done all the wet lab work, and you want to take a bioinformatics approach to try and validate whether this is true, so that when you actually apply a different scenario, you can then generate a new hypothesis that you can then potentially validate in the lab. Question? Uh, for the number of countries, uh, does the algorithm uh, measure the primary how many <coughs> Factors, or you define how many factors? So, uh, the, so the question is, does the tool automatically define the number of clusters? And the answer is yes. Most of the algorithms that we use will do that. That's that's the best approach because it's. So. so oh, yeah. Sorry, do I have your permission to continue up till 10.30 or we can break and then, is that okay? I have, I don't know how many slides. I'm, get, I'm getting pretty much towards the end of my talk. And, and if we finish early, it's time for questions. And if not, we can break early, okay? So, um, so what I want to start off is explaining what a functional interaction is. It's a little different than a traditional protein-protein interaction network. So a functional interaction network is a high, is a, I was going to say highly, but it's a reliable biological network based on manually curated pathways, which are then extended with verified interactions from other data sources. Um, so the first step in creating this functional interaction is to actually um, basically reduce the complexity of these reactions that you see in pathways down to a series of binary interactions. And so you can have you can conceptually believe that input one and two interact with one another. Input one interacts with the catalyst. You know, the inhibitor might actually in interact with the catalyst as well. Uh, the, the two inputs in this formation of this complex could well interact. You know, interact with this and other members of these of the reactions. So the output is a series of binary interactions. And so in order to do this for the function attraction network, we've taken a whole series of pathway databases, and not just Reactome, but also Panther, KEG. Um, NCI Nature represents the NCI PIT database. Um, NCI BioCard, BioCard is just another pathway database. Uh, they're more, uh, they have, they're less annotation rich in terms of you know, gene protein information. They are better known for their kind of nice pathway diagrams. But you can actually get that, you know, gene and protein information. And then TRED is um, a transcription factor regulation database. I can't remember what the E stands for. But essentially, you build this big, long list of binary interactions. And this becomes what we call the annotated functional interactions. And then in the, the second part of the construction of the network, um, you use a simple uh, machine learning technique uh, to score the protein interactions from all these different pairwise databases. So you can see that you, can, you basically are, con so we're converting some of the fly yeast protein-protein interactions into human orthologs interactions. Um, this co-expression data and this go information. So genes that share similar biological process annotations uh, could well likely interact with one another in some way or other. That interaction could be indirect. That means to say there could be other partners in between, but that's still a way of building up a network. And so after we've scored these interactions, we can, uh, which we call predicted functional interactions, we combine these two data sets and we create this large functional interaction network. Now, when we first did this four versions ago, the number of interactions, 270,000 interactions, and it had just over 9,000 proteins. Now the, the size of the network is you know, just over 36, th sorry, uh, 336,000 interactions and almost 12,000 Swiss pro proteins are in the network. So that's coverage of almost well, of 58%. So as I said to you before, pathway databases typically have coverage of about 30% of the known proteins. 
Um, now we're at almost 60% here. Now, to try and visualize this network would be crazy because it, would, it literally would be a furball. But it's a source from which you can project your data sets into. And so just to show you how that works, uh, just imagine this. This is a nice little slide from Arena in the back there. Uh, so imagine this was your net. This is the Reactum functional interaction network here. And you start projecting your genes into that list. So I'll just see how it looks to you. Does it look better for me? There's, there's red circles. And it's purple, so it doesn't, these could be genes that are upregulated, downregulated, they could be have mutations or not. It could be any kind of data, but essentially these are genes or proteins. And you're projecting that into the network. And based on that projection, you know that some of these proteins interact with one another. And so you, these are the yellow lines. But there's still some kind of sparse connections within the network. And so what we can do is add these things called linker genes. Or linker proteins and these are basically there to provide a level of connectivity between the elements within the network and now what you've done is created a sub network and then you basically take away the rest of the network because you're not interested in that you can still interact with that rest of the network if you choose by trying to uh, but basically now we've got a small sub network and actually it looks a little bit better on the screen uh, here and this is basically the subnetwork, which is hopefully trying to help you to understand what's going on in your gene list. Yes. Um, just because you're seeing, you know, lots of connections here and here, that's just by chance. That's not the, you've not, you've not, you've not explored that in any way computationally. It's not, there's no algorithm yet. It just, to me, this is just a, this is just a visual, this is a hypothetical network in a way. This is, this is not necessarily, um, if I tried to show you the reactor, just be a big mass like that. You could not understand. It's not the thing here is this is a what we call an unweighted network. You haven't thought about any of the, the basic network characteristics yet. Clustering helps you identify a region of focus. That's what it kind of is. So we haven't quite got it there, but we're moving in that direction. So the question is yeah. Basically, it's the, it's the minimal range. So basically, how are the how are you how do we decide what these linkers are and how they insert into the network? They're basically the minimal amount of genes you need to or proteins you need to add to this network to provide that connectivity between different um, the different unconnected regions of the network. Yes. Yes. This one here? Yeah. 
answer to that cutoff. Um, I don't remember how it was selected, but obviously there needs to be, if you imagine uh, A interacts with B, A is Y, and A is a protein. <laughs> if A is conserved, it gives, and B is conserved, there's a very good likelihood that if that biological process is conserved, So that's an assumption that I'm making here, but uh, uh, that's that's how it just applies. Yeah, yeah I, 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 mean, I mean, that's what I, I thought before. Like, you know, like, you know, if you, you are at this farther you go uh, between species and yeah. farther you go between trying to. You could, but the thing to think about is like some some process of turning to say the cell, the human cell, there's a lot similar biological process, like metabolism, it's almost identical. The same genes, the same protein can evolve, whether it's in yeast or whether it's in human cell. So you could argue that those interactions. And that's something to think about about the process. Whether it's conservation between organisms. It's a like strong mechanism that it's a similar core mechanism and therefore it's similar core interaction. But clearly if there's interactions because a protein exists with its fly and the system to give it, that's not going to be a similar core. So that's just I'm trying to find how you come up with the uh the rate of functional interactions. Uh, so you take the main phase classifier. Trained on the pathways, uh, some of the annotators, yes. And so my question is, what is the input? So you're getting the classifier from like the rest of the database. Sequence information? Is it some kind of, what is it? Or like, uh, I just want to do this. So that that there's any work from somebody else, I'm just trying to do this. Uh, or is this like which genes are all other genes? It's, I think it's that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Other genes are all the same. Sorry, I'm just animations. All right. So, um, so there are many efforts um, underway globally to kind of sequence the genomes uh, from patients with many different types of disease. So, uh, we're using in this example, we're talk I'm talking about uh, mutations derived from pancreatic cancer. And we can use network analysis here to kind of help interpret these data sets. Um, for example, you get this kind of recurrent gain of mutation uh, in KRAS in pancreatic cancer. Um, but you get these frequent, you know, you get a, you know, smaller, lower frequency mutations in a whole host of other uh, genes. And the question is, um, how is, you know, a gene down here in this long tail of contributing to this disease phenotype. Um, and these genes themselves could rare, represent uh, rare driver mutations as well, uh, or they could be um, other kind of somatic variants who have to interact with other genes in this, in the, in this uh, data set to actually cause a phenotype. And so we, to, in order to gain deeper understanding of pancreatic uh, li gene lists generated from pancreatic cancer data sets, uh, we can take that kind of set of mutated genes and project that into the reactive functional interaction interaction network. We can then, and this is just the results here. So this is actually a clustered network. So you can see that there's discrete groups of highly connected proteins. And once you've identified these clusters of genes, you can then annotate them with the Richmond analysis tools to identify putative biological roles for these genes in these, uh, in these clusters. So you can see uh, TP53 is a highly mutated gene in pancreatic cancer. So you can expect to see a TP53 uh, signaling uh, module. Um, but here, as much as you might see things in, in signaling as well, calcium signaling that are known to have roles in pancreatic cancer, you can identify 
new biological processes that you might not necessarily be thinking about because these genes uh, are, you know, these genes are tightly connected and they could be associated with this biological role. In fact, one of them was axon guidance. Um, so axon guidance actually appears twice because there's slightly different pathways uh, with the axon guidance annotation and they cluster distinctly into two groups. But, you know, axon guidance is a process which, you know, neurons grow into um, target cells. So how is that related to cancer? And as it turned out, it was, you know, it was something that was kind of hypothesized, like, what's this going on? And then they've actually started to do some experiments, and they've discovered that uh, one of the kind of sub-pathways with an axon guidance called uh, slip 2 robo-signaling um, may, in fact, enhance metastases in pancreatic cancer and predispose pancreatic cancer cells to metastasize into, uh, into the neural tissue. So here's where we've discovered something in a network. It's been taken back into the laboratory and, you know, it's actually shown to actually have some consequence. Yes, so one thing to point out, it's a good point, the, the, the node size uh, corresponds to the number of times that gene has been given. So KRAS is one of the, the driver implementations, so it's, it forms its own uh, uh, module here. TP53 is another highly mutated gene. And then the other nodes are smaller and they reflect of a much lower rate of mutation in the patient samples. Sorry, we leave that for you back here. This is, we're looking at a much smaller number of interactions in the day from the people. The rest of the functional interaction network is... is, is all the that's all the genes. That's, that's the majority of genes that are in that list. There are possibly genes that could be in the gene list which do not appear in the interaction network. Therefore, they may not necessarily be... If there's no interaction for that gene... Uh, they're, they're, yeah. right. There could be other mutations, right? There could be other genes that are brought in. Um, the linkers, well, this doesn't have linkers, so there's no additional. But it's possible if you want to add more interaction into it. So if there's another question for you, may I ask Yes. John Brown. So that's a very good point. So using this, we've used the Newman algorithm. So it doesn't take into consideration the frequency of the mutation. But if you were to look at HotNet as an algorithm, you would actually just, if you were to take that same data set and actually apply it to the HotNet, um, it, would, it would give a slightly different result. And that's because the algorithm is trying to look for a different kind of Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So um, it could be. Um, there's a grant that we've submitted. We're just trying to put a try and actually build it. I hope you get it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we do. It's epic, uh, but the idea is to take into consideration the functional impact of right. mutation and its role in the biological process. Absolutely. You can use. We're going to talk a little bit about something in a moment, uh, which is kind of it kind of brings it in. 
I have to say I'm going to lose all of you in the audience when I start talking about this because it is a really I'm going to follow you. It's, 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 it's complicated to explain and I've tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, but, yeah. I'm okay on time. All right. Um, I've got about 10 minutes, so we'll try and run. I hope I don't run over. Um, so one other approach I kind of was talking to earlier about using the, the mark, the the MCL algorithm. I've just forgotten what Markov clustering. Uh, you can combine gene expression data uh, into the reactome functional interaction network. And based on available clinical information, you could potentially try to identify um, network modules uh, that could be related to patient outcome um, or patient survival or some other prognostic signature. Um, so basically, um, the starting point here is gene expression data. You have a whole list of genes and the columns are essentially all the samples that you have within the data set. So you have expression values for each of the different genes in all the different samples. And it's the same sample. It's going to be a patient. This is, is a very applicable approach to uh, basically uh, samples from pa uh, cancer patients. Or you could actually use this. Also been, this approach has also been demonstrated with uh, cardiovascular uh, disease and uh, type 2 diabetes. So you can use this approach when you have that expression data available. So what you do is you, you create the network based on your gene expression list, the, so the gene list within the expression data. And then once you've, once you've identified those clusters uh, of tightly, knit, uh, tightly connected genes, you then uh, perform uh, something called Cox proportional hazards. And the idea there is to kind of, you know, screen around the individual modules to identify a potentially clinically significant module. And that's typically based upon clinical data. And that clinical data could be whether uh, a patient is alive or dead. Okay, it's, it's a very straightforward question you're asking. But uh, that, can form, that can fit into this kind of survival analysis approach. You know. And once you've identified a possible module that's relevant, that's clinic, potentially clinically significant, you can then run Kaplan-Meier survival analysis. And basically, you get this plot at the end. And basically, um, you're basically plotting survival probability versus the elapsed time for the different groups of the samples. And so what it, the, 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 the Kaplan-Meier the Kaplan analysis divides the samples into two groups. Basically, um, samples having low expression within this particular module of gene, genes, and then high expression, which is within these genes for this module. And so, um, in this particular module, it's been annotated with um, cell cycle and aurora, aurora B signaling. So. The idea here is that the 31 genes in this module are significantly related to this breast cancer data set. And so 
patients, the, the, the hypothesis is that patients with low expression in these module genes have a better outcome than patients whose genes are more highly expressed in this module. So the idea here is that a single network module or more than one module could be useful in, a, in, in defining a signature, um, a prognostic signature. So it's, we will try to demonstrate this in the lab if time permits so you can understand this a little better. Yes? So you do the clustering? Yes. You've inputted that into the network. You're using you're using the gene correlations to actually weight the network, and then you cluster based on one of the algorithm. The algorithm. Then you annotate those modules with pathway annotations, and then the next step is to ask the question: You know, within these modules, are there any genes that could well predict, you know, patient survivability, patient survivability? And, you, and basically, in that analysis, you break the genes into two groups based on the sample. You know, in this case, it's high expression and low expression because they, it's gene expression data. So if it's somatic mutation data, it could be whether a gene is mutated or not mutated. And how do you track this uh, predictive information? Like, do they get, like, uh, a of or how do you... It's, it's part of the survival analysis. It's just... Uh, it's like main time or expression level is like this uh, block of speed survival. Yes, it just, creates, it just creates a plot and then you do the log rank between these two lines and you ask whether it's significant or not. Yes? So the question is how many samples have been run this? Um, so <laughs> one of the times we did this a couple of years ago, we had a, we had a we, we, craft, we, we, we could actually the problem with the model is actually downloading the file, just 62 megabytes, and it has, if I recall, it had about 300 samples or something like it in there. Um, and all the genes that had been they had gene expression data for. Um, the, the, it can it can have several hundred files. It's not had several hundred samples. It might even be able to say that um, with one of the other tools with the newer um, of the network and the tools, I believe it can even go beyond the browser. Like, because it's designed to analyze very large data sets, and a lot of the cancer genome atlas experiments are generating like thousands and thousands of data points. So. Okay, I'm going to push forward here and just wrap up in the last few minutes. Um, this is going to be a tough sell to you. It's a rather interesting area. Uh, it's an interesting approach to data analysis. I have to be honest, there's only a handful of tools out that actually support this approach. And as some of those tools may well be, have been developed some time ago, some of those tools have been developed on simulated data. That means to say it's not truly relevant biological data. So it's, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would view these tools as somewhat experimental in approach. And also the availability of the data because you need to have very large data sets and you may need to have things like copy number variation and gene expression data. Whereas what we've been discussing about in the last two goals, well, the two, the, two uh, the talk from Yuri yesterday and what I've just discussed, you're typically analyzing one data set at a time. Here, you're actually trying to integrate more than one data set at a time, maybe three. And the availability of three data sets that you could actually use for some of these tools is based on you know, the, how those experiments have been formed, whether it's the same samples, it's very difficult to get those data sets. Again, cancer data sets are actually very well used, are very applicable data sets and use cases in this because it's, it's one of the only kind of diseases where people are generating you know, copy number variation, sequence information, gene expression data, um, protein state information as well, which could be useful. So this approach basically tries to infer how pathway states are disrupted in disease. Um, so you're going to use qualitative and quantitative measurements to infer the activities of various components within the network or in the pathway. 
and ask the, cost, the question, what are the consequences of those actions? So it kind of alludes to somebody who was talking about functional impact of a mutation. You can potentially look at this in this tool, although you do need to have that mutation information and you may well need to have gene expression data as well to support that. So some of the tools that are already available include um, uh, CellNet Analyzer. It's a MATLAB tool. Um, it's very useful in providing uh, the algorithms and visualization tools for metabolic engineering. So this is more appropriate for looking at biochemical systems or metabolomics data. Um, the next tool is uh, uh, NetForest or Networkin. Uh, actually, Networkin is superseded. Uh, NetForest has been superseded by Networking, um, and basically the idea here is to try and understand the underlying intracellular signaling networks. Uh, within large-scale phosphoproteomic data sets. Um, so you can, you can basically elucidate the phosphorylation events associated with a given phenotype or a disease. There's arachne, which uh, it's a novel algorithm which analyzes microarray data and is specifically designed to scale up to kind of the complexity of regulatory networks uh, in mammalian cells. Um, and the idea there is to basically identify um, Transcriptionally, regular, transcriptionally related network um, modules. Um, and then this paradigm, which I'm going to talk about now, uh, which is actually the most common form for doing pathway modeling within cancer data sets. Um, so probabilistic graphical models, PGMs, um, are widely used techniques in machine learning and statistics for modeling of complex dependencies uh, amongst a variety of variables. Basically, it's a say, way of saying that it's a way of studying a lot of different elements within your network. And it's recently been applied to uh, understanding of cancer network, cancer networks. And so the goal here is to integrate different types of omics data into these models. So if you have copy number variation data, gene expression data, mutation, or even protein state information, you, you try to project that in, all of that information into a network to identify significantly impacted pathways and then to try and link um, the, the activities that you're seeing uh, to particular path, not, the, the activities within particular pathways to particular patient uh, phenotypes. Now, in order to do this, this is where we get into a, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So traditionally, a protein-protein interaction network, you think of one protein, one node. That node interacts with another node. Um, in order to integrate multiple data types simultaneously, you have to think of that one protein node now becomes several nodes because the protein is encoded by a gene. There's a transcript. It could be a protein state. Um, and actually, when you start thinking of other layers of information, potentially, one node becomes many nodes. A basis of the, this, this approach, you should think of four nodes. Uh, gene copy number, expression state, protein level, and protein activity. Um, and basically this is demonstrated in figure, in this um, C here. So you have a simple pathway, MDM2, TP53 are the single nodes that you know, are involved in regulating this apoptotic pathway. But MDM2 is represented by a molecule in DNA, an RNA protein, and then there's an active protein. And this interacts with a reaction within the TP53 network. So basically, rather than just having two elements, or maybe three if you think of the, yeah, the apoptosis as an additional element, you now have several molecules. And then you project your data into this network. And this is actually called a factor graph here. Um, and once you've created your network, the next step is to infer pathway levels for each of those, sorry, I'll go back, each of those elements of this network. And then this is where it gets a little, it gets a little bit complicated. It's a series of classifiers that you need to train to uh, identify these inferred pathway levels. And the output essentially is, um, is um, the pathway activities for these given molecules. And the best way to kind of represent this is by in a, in a, in a cluster in a cluster heat map. So in this example where they've analyzed uh, glioblastoma multiforme data, um, 
you can see that the significant pathway perturbations, these are the pathways here. So you can see that they've been broken down into four clusters. The fourth cluster is probably the most interesting here because we see that the, there's um, uh, distinct down regulation of HIF1 pathway here. And then in the other three clusters, you can see that there's very distinct EGFR signaling. Um, you can actually see there's overexpression of EGFR and also E2F. So these, these, these pathways aren't just picked by choice. These are actually pathways that are known to be influenced by glioblastoma. These are pathways that are known to have altered activities within glioblastoma. And so basically all of these, sorry, I should explain, all these clusters represent a different sample and the rows are representing the different uh, components of the pathway. It's a tricky approach to actually understand, and I do apologize if it's not clear to you. It's, the, it's one sample from one patient. Oh, that's a good point. Um, so each column corresponds to a single sample, right? Each row is an entity. And I'm actually just trying to think how many patients were in this study, actually, just to, to give you that number. The only way that the patient, the patients would be in this, or the samples would be in this experiment, if you have data for all four cases, there's gene expression data and copy number, or you know, at least copy number data. So, it seems like this data yes. So, for paradigm, the good news is, this is where it gets kind of, is that the source code to actually run this is very difficult to compile. Um, the project, you know, creating these factor graphs is actually a very time-consuming effort. Um, and so there's not a lot of pathway modules available. Um, it's not very well documented approach. It takes a long time to run to actually create these factor graphs and then to project all of that data into those graphs. It takes a tremendous amount of time. Um, the good news is we're trying to develop an application. It is an alpha testing. Um, you can attempt to use it. There are a couple of data sets. Uh, they're not available for this workshop, but if you go to our user guide, you can actually, uh, the, the React on Functional Interaction user guide, you will actually find this information. Um, and we are trying to find a way to kind of speed up the creation of these different pathway modules, uh, models, um, and then to improve performance and then, that's fine. So just in summary, uh, I have a list of all the different pathway, some of the different pathway databases and network databases we've talked about today. Um, is a summary of some of the different uh, de novo network construction tools. Uh, you'll hear from G Quaid about Gene Mania shortly. We'll be demonstrating the, the app in the next, uh, in, um, in the lab. Um, in terms of pathway modeling, um, here's some links to some of the resources. And apparently we're on a coffee break now. So I'll take any more questions if anybody has, otherwise we'll break for a break.